Why is the West buying gold? Well, because we know that the world is de-dollarizing. We know that the world is becoming multipolar. And if it's multipolar in currency, it still needs something to back those currencies, whether it's explicitly or implicitly. And if I, in France, want to buy pistachios from Turkey, I'm not saying I do, but if I did, they may say they want gold. Maybe they mm -hmm. won't take dollars. Who knows? Russia is certainly not going to take dollars. And right. so you need to have some on your balance sheet as a bank, as a country, to trade internationally. Central banks are buying gold because they need gold. It's not a pretty object to them. Mm -hmm. Silver and gold investors have been on a roller coaster ride as of late. Price and sentiment have experienced some pretty extreme volatility. Today, we have a special guest, Vince Lancey. He's the owner of Echo Bay Partners and publisher of the Gold Fix newsletter. We're going to talk with Vince to see if we can make some sense of what's going on out there. Has the macro environment, have the weather conditions changed for the silver price and gold price? Vince, welcome to Ron's Basement. Uh, thank you for having me on, Ron. Look forward to it. And uh, we were talking off the air. I wanted to say I appreciate your background. Everyone else is so dry. It's nice to have someone who's got the right vibe going on for the season. Right. Well, we have the bears back there and their blindfolds will come off. The gold bear over my right shoulder. <laughs> uh, when the uh, when the gold price hits twenty five hundred dollars, we will uh, we will remove the blindfold. So, oh, that's how that what, works. What, nice. That's how that works. Yeah, there's a silver that. bear and a platinum bear too. But you never know, okay. Vince. You may just be here for the big unveiling uh, or the oh, unveiling cool. party. That'd be cool. <laughs> I like that. But before but before we get there, uh, we we need some things to change in the market. What what are your thoughts on on let's just say the last couple of weeks these volatile moves and gold in particular. Any any high-level thoughts on that? Sure. Um, for the last couple of weeks have been particularly uh, momentous. I'm sure your audience knows that. Uh, just taking the last couple of weeks in, 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 in context of the huge picture that is affecting uh, that I think what your audience wants to hear and they'll be, and they'll be, they'll get it. Today they're going to hear it, um, is you're seeing the last two weeks price action is a manifestation of uh, a war, right? A financial war. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the demand in the East from China is the physical demand. We're not talking about future speculators. The, I want the metal, I want the gold. I don't care about your correlation with the dollar or your financial issues with this or that. I want the gold. Um, those people are starting to leak out of China uh, the, the demand, I should say, and it's starting to affect Western prices. So over the years, many gold bugs and silver bugs have uh, righteously complained about uh, the price of metals being uh, uh, artificially low uh, because of the dollar dominance. And I'm not here to bash the dollar, but I am here to say that that's true. Um, what's also happening is, is what's, what's happening now is, for example, Sunday night, uh, December 3rd, we had that massive spike and then sell off. Now I covered that, you know, in depth, tactically what happened blow by blow, but we're not going to talk about that here. I just want to say that China keeps importing gold and we keep selling gold. So if the price in China is higher than the price here, either the price is going to go up here or the gold is going to go over there. And both of those things are happening at the same time. Now, the reason the last two weeks have been very important uh, for a, a number of reasons, but the but the China thing I wanna I wanna make clear here is that is that their demand is starting to transmit into the Western pricing markets. So if you look at uh, uh instead of looking at China and US, you can look at their proxies the COMEX in the U.S. Uh, as a price discoverer and the Shanghai Gold Exchange in China. And the Shanghai Gold Exchange has become a black hole just sucking all the gold in and the COMEX is emptying it out among other places. And eventually when that stops, uh, it will stop when the price goes up. So what we've seen for the last two weeks in this big, big picture um, is first and foremost, most immediate, 
Uh, the driver has been the growing competition from China in pricing gold. They've already been buying all the gold, but now they're pricing gold. Uh, the other factors, and I think these are all factors that we can discuss in the whole macro picture that have converged on these last two weeks have been, well, there are, the world has changed. And I know that's almost a, uh, it's trite to hear almost now, uh, but I'm going, you know, I'm going to tell you how the world has changed uh, ir irrevocably. Uh, and that's the first thing. And the second thing is there's a seasonality to gold that I don't think many people talk about. And while it's not a reason to invest in gold, it's a reason to understand why it goes up during this time of year, why it goes down other times of year. So, I mean, which would you which would you like to to go into first? Well, let me. I'm going to ask you a question about this: the gold moving from the west, from the COMEX and the LBMA to the east. Is that um, uh, indicative or an example of physical demand overwhelming the paper market? Because I've heard people talk about that over the years that eventually, you know, the 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 physical demand is what will. Um, I don't want to say break the COMEX or, you know, but, but does yeah. that make sense? My question, yeah. my question. It, it, it does. It does. And, and I have to go a little bit higher level um, in terms of uh, backing off to, to paint this global picture. Now, uh, for those of your viewers that are my age or older, uh, they're going to say, yeah, I get it. For those a little bit younger, uh, they're going to say, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, what can I do about it? So th th this is this is what's going on. This is this is actually geopolitical. Okay, we all have been hearing about the BRICS for the last year, but they're not in the headlines right now. But this is a manifestation of half of the world. This starts with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Okay, mm -hmm. without getting into it, this starts with half the world, the BRICS, being completely unhappy with the way the dollar. Uh, depreciates their currency, depreciates the price of their natural resources, and they feel they're getting a short end of the stick in the global economy. And for many reasons, they're correct. Now, if you look at the world as uh, a company, the West, just to give you an idea of their role, the West, G7, I'll say US, but I mean West, G7, US. Uh, the West is the... Uh, I'm simplifying. I'm not trying to slight anyone here. The West is prides itself on its technological innovation, on its management expertise, and on its financial acumen, right? So the West is management, okay? In, mm -hmm. in its own eyes, okay? Yeah. So if anyone's yeah. from the BRICS over there, I'm not saying that we are, all right? In the East, the East feels like they've been treated like the underpaid labor. And, you know, you can mm -hmm. see how that works, you know? Uh, your sneakers come from wherever, you know, for $5 made by a kid, unfortunately. Um, the other thing that the East uh, contributes to the global pie is the natural resources, right? So forgetting the fact that we are big oil makers, you know, now, but let's just say all the oil comes from Saudi Arabia. They take the oil, their labor pulls it out of the ground. We buy it from them. We innovate it. We make gasoline. We make nice TVs. Or we make the technology to make nice TVs, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. that's the world as one big business. The East, for years, has been complaining uh, that they're getting the short end of the business stick. And you know what? Uh, to some extent, they're right. Not to every bit of it, but to some of it, they're right. But they've shut up. And they've taken it like like any underpaid employee who's trying to dig themselves out from it, something. Yeah. Last several years, their economy is nothing to laugh at anymore. And I'm speaking specifically about China. Russia is in that in that category as well. But China is the engine of the BRICS. And these countries start to say, you know what? We want better deals. We want to renegotiate with management. Right. And and and. And they're in the process. It's happening. You know, China's been accumulating gold. Everyone's been accumulating gold for years. We'll get into exactly what gold is about in a second because it's really very simple and people don't want to look at it. I want to paint this picture for you. Can I, can um, I, can I, I want to interject? Hey, yeah. Vince, I want to interject a question because I love where you're going with this. Good. And I've never thought about this, but could we look at the BRICS and what's going on with BRICS Plus and the other countries almost like they're unionizing if we're looking it. at it from a... 
Okay. That, Thank you. I'm it. sorry I interrupted you. No, no, sorry no. That's exactly you. it. That's exactly it. They are the union. They're, they're, they're the labor yeah. that is finally unionized. I mean, you know, you've got the Saudis and the Iranians, you know, not attacking each other because they have this common enemy. And the common enemy mm -hmm. is the, the top hatted manager in the West running the company, the monopoly guy. Yeah, that's exactly that's spot on right. Okay, so so the BRICS are, you know, probably negotiating with us saying, you know what, we want a bigger place, piece of the pie. The late, the unions are negotiating with their management, ongoing. And then the Ukrainian war starts and Russia uh, uh, believes that having their assets, their dollar-based assets frozen, uh, is Russia's like, you know, you're, you, you basically confiscated our money and our money had been held in dollars their money, I should say, right? And that makes all the BRICs worried. Maybe we should mm -hmm. accelerate our de-dollarization process. And so they start accelerating their purchases of gold. Now the West will be saying, well, you need dollars, uh, you can't. And all the BRICs, long story short, saying, we're not really comfortable with uh, all this dollar risk, knowing that the bank could just take our money. So we want to diversify our monetary risk uh, and put some of that into alternative assets. What are we going to put it in? Well, they don't trust each other either. They're not going to put their money in naked yuan or or or, or rupees or or rubles. You know, they're they're going to find something that's agnostic, that's neutral, that stood the test of time, and they all already own some, and that's gold. Okay, so so gold comes in, gold comes in in this part of the world as, and this is key, this is why the price transmission is happening. I'm giving it all to you right here, believe it or not. The, the price transmission is happening because the West has been, the West has been very comfortable shorting gold or not owning gold because we have no physical use for it. It's too expensive for, too expensive for most industry. And we have demonetized it since 1971, uh, formalized in 76, and made it so that it can't compete with the dollar legally anymore. There's all kinds of little things that we've done there. And in doing that, we've made it a pet rock, mm -hmm. right? Well, it still is a pet rock. And... But the other countries in the BRICS, they want the pet rock because they want to use it to store their wealth now. They're getting off dollars. And by getting off dollars, I don't mean just dollars. They're getting off of U.S. treasuries. That's why the treasury market is sold off. You know, it's like it's like our grandparents, right? You, you, your, your grandmother has a bank account and she has money in a CD. And when she needs cash, she breaks the CD and she uses the cash to buy all those bears and Christmas presents uh, that, that she gets us. Um, however, uh, when you're a central bank or you're a country, you don't use CDs, use treasuries. You know, uh, what are you going to use instead of a treasury to store your wealth? You're going to use gold. Yeah. So and this is key. In the West, people buy gold because they think it's going up, it's going down, generally speaking. In the East, they're buying because they want to hold it. They physically want it. They're going to use it as stores of value. The reason that probably some of your audience uses it for. Right. So in doing that, they want it. They want the gold. And in doing that, the price can no longer be hidden with financial uh, derivatives. I want mm -hmm. the gold. You can no longer short it or write options against it or use it for other means. And that's... The fact that they physically want the gold brought to them, which you brought up, is why uh, the West has to keep giving them gold at the price they want it or allow the price to e uh, equalize with the BRICS price. And and uh, uh, that's what's happening. The price will so go up because half the world wants it. And the other half needs it, meaning our half, we need it if we want to buy stuff from them. It, it feels like it, uh, and I've said this before, like since 1971, when President Nixon temporarily took us off the gold standard, that we've been living in this temporary, uh, because he did say temporary, kind of world of illusion that enabled the United States to pull these financial, uh, I'm going to say tricks, but games on the rest of the world to be the strong handed management. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. 
events, but it feels like now we've had some uh, what what we could qualify as fundamental geopolitical world changes, right? Half the world, you know, moving away from us. But as the result of what happened over the last 50 years, it, it enabled the United States because of like the petrodollar and the fact, and, and he, I think we almost did, and I, you know, this is just my theory, but we did the same thing with China, right? We told Saudi Arabia, sure, you know, only, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll protect you if you only sell oil for dollars. And yeah. by the way, uh, after you get those dollars, we've got a great option for you where you can put them, which is U.S. Treasuries, yeah. which enabled the USA to to run these big deficits and for us to live beyond our means. Is yeah. that is that correct? OK, that's, so now yeah. so now now we're and we did kind of did the same thing with China. But instead of oil, maybe we did it with manufactured. Oh, products. absolutely. That's spot on. That's exactly what we did. You buy okay. our treasuries. We'll buy your stuff. So. So now we find ourselves in a situation like everything, for lack of a better way to describe it, has come to a head. The world, half the world or more, is saying enough is enough. We're, we're you know, we're calling your bluff on this. Mm -hmm. But it's happening to the United States at, at just a time where we've acquired debt levels um, and deficits that are adding to the debt level that 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 we've only seen during times of war or depression and like we're like like if i look out if i if i compare the last 50 years and everything you and i just described mm -hmm. and then look at you know slice out the last three years or two years and everything that's changed and look at the next 50 years it doesn't look real optimistic <laughs> I don't uh, wanna... not not for the current economic model um yeah you know uh if i could just piece together in like one big timeline of what you're describing we, because of, you know, who we are, we tend to look at the world as, you know, say, I mean, we could tend to look at the world as uh, in the post-World War II world, the United States has been the dominant economy, the dominant currency, the dominant uh, policeman. And, uh, and, and some of that may continue, but I, I would prefer to look at it this way in terms of economic models. Before World War II, the world was largely um mercantilistic now i'm not going to say it was mercantilistic but but mercantilism is when countries uh uh protect themselves for a lot of protectionism right they transact internationally in gold okay and they uh they will endeavor to make and sell more than they buy now that sounds obvious but it's mm -hmm. not so i'm a country my goal is to constantly have a trade surplus, which is the opposite of what you just said that we're going through right now. And in a trade surplus environment, you have to be self-sufficient, right? So we have to buy American. We have to do all these things. Uh, we're not going to allow you to buy a, a German car. You have to buy an American car. I, mean, I don't mean to be prohibitive of that. I'm just saying the country, uh, the country encourages domestic consumption of its own produced goods and seeks to create value-added goods, whether it be missiles or microwaves, and sell them to the rest of the world. That's what the world did before the end of World War II. And after the end of World War II, with the advent of the dollar, we had a global economy. We no longer had to make stuff. Like you said, mm -hmm. we outsourced our labor to, um, uh, to the Far East. Uh, that's the manufacturing in China and Taiwan and all these other places at the time. We outsourced our natural resources to uh, to Saudi Arabia. That's the natural. That's the uh, oil. We sold them guns and we sold them treasuries, and and it worked because it no. I no longer had to make more than I took, and so that's how we lived, as you described, uh, beyond our means. But now, and this is like a this is where it all comes together. But now. The world is going back to a less global world. So it's fragmenting. It's more regional. You can use the Cold World two, War II Iron Curtain thing going up, right? So we mm -hmm. can't buy Russian caviar anymore. So American caviar, right. if we have it, is going to be more expensive. You know, they can't buy uh, Levi's jeans. So they're going to go up in price there. And you have this, you have this world divide, this mercantilistic type of world. Um, where everyone cares about their trade. And in mercantilism, you need gold if you want to transact across the border. I'm not taking your dollars. You're not taking my rubles. 
Well, what are we going to deal with? Well, maybe it'll be maybe some Bitcoin down the road. But for now, we both have gold. We both trust it. No one has a problem with it. Let's use yeah. gold. And so as a result, the world's complexity collapses, mm -hmm. right? Trade uh, gets strained, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The price of resources that you don't have goes up, gold, right? The price of mm -hmm. things that you do have goes down, you know, flat screen TVs. We don't need those anymore. You know, we don't need more right. of those. You can't make them that much better. And um, the world uh, becomes like a Cold War to environment. And the reason I, I brought all this up is because you said the word war. Mm -hmm. If you ignore, and I don't mean to ignore them, if you ignore the, the Ukrainian war and the Israeli Hamas war, we're at war anyway. It's yeah. it's a financial war. It's it's a proxy war for the dominance of the dollar. It's a proxy war, or let's assume that they're working together, right? If they're working together, and I mean this in a good way, if they're working together, then we're trying to change the whole world's economy without having a world war. And that's what we're doing right now. So yeah, this is a war. And we, if we're not careful, we will get financially repressed because we're being lulled into thinking that it's just one of those days. If you're looking to buy gold, silver, or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices, quality, and service. I think Pimbex is best, and you will too. And be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's Basement. When you were speaking earlier, describing like this, uh, I guess, uh, rise of nationalism to a yeah. certain degree or the fragmentation. Is it, and, and, and as you were speaking, it came to my mind, like it, it felt like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, like the world is moving away from being willing to accept IOUs from each other. And it's like, no, if you yeah. want this, you need to give me something real. And it starts with the letter G. <laughs> right. No, no, that, that's absolutely like that's hitting the nail on the head. See, see, there's a there's an analyst. He worked at Credit Suisse and I, I've covered him extensively and broken mm -hmm. down his work in my writings uh, called Zoltan Pozar. So mm -hmm. and, uh, Zero Hedge writes about him a lot as well. But uh, I break down his stuff uh, 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 th thoroughly, if not if not accurately. Um, and one of the things. One of the things uh, that he noticed, and and I I tried to elaborate on, is what you're saying, and that is, and that is, when you say there's no more IOUs, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of your listeners probably say, yeah, no debt, no deficit, right? That's true, but also in trade, it means there's no pay you in thirty days. There's no more IOUs. It's all yeah. cash and carry. You kill the futures markets, okay? Because mm -hmm. I'm not <clears throat> sure. So I'm I'm a I'm a uh, I'm a green giant, and I have to buy soybeans from you. Well, 90 days out, you may not have them anymore because your supplier is no longer there. So we can no longer bank on longer term trade. We have to do everything shorter term. Everything becomes cash and carry, less futures, less IOUs, less collateral go around, less less. Uh, double dipping on assets. You know, I'm going to borrow from yeah. Peter to pay to Paul. You can't do that. And you will uh, hurt the economy drastically. And uh, and that's why we're, that's why one of the reasons we, we printed so much money. And in, in doing that, in doing that, you, uh, you're, you're throwing a lot of extra liquidity into a system uh, that can't really move it around efficiently because the supply yeah. chains are broken and what have you. Uh, so uh, I think when you say there's, you know, no more IOUs and no more credit. Yeah, it's it's the death of financialization. Like if I had mm -hmm. a, if I, well, I do. If I had 14-year-old children, I would be saying to them, uh, you don't want to go into business in finance. You want to go into business in manufacturing. To your point of the real versus the esoteric, we mm -hmm. used to be into <clears throat> abstractions, you know, uh, the value added and all that stuff. Now it's like, well, do you have it? Do, do you have right. it? And, and, and the real world is getting in the way of, of our abstractions. The nationalism, I think, is, is also a, a, a really uh, important aspect to this. And I think, I think you, you brought that up. It's actually, if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that as well, because it's actually fascinating when you're trying to figure out what China and Russia actually have done over the last 30 years. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. The world uh, seems to be changing. And and I think as you were talking as well, I think about like just a lot of the derivative contracts out there, right? On, you know, futures contracts and uh, I don't know, orange juice, right? Like uh, do, do I want the orange juice now. I don't know that I want to buy a, yeah. a contract or if I think it's going to be delivered in 60 days or six months or whatever yeah. the contract might be that, that people are moving toward wanting um, like you said, cash and cash and carry as there's less, less trust amongst nations. Um, everybody, it, 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 I don't know, it distills back to the real assets. And I think in my opinion, one of the most real of the real assets are, are gold and silver. Yeah. And, and that'll affect the quote unquote price as measured in U S dollars or euros or yen or whatever fiat currency we want to look at. That, that, that's right. You know, you use orange juice as an example. I could use silver as an example, a direct mm -hmm. line of events that will that will play out exactly what you said. The amount of above ground silver is decreasing or it's hard to find. There's a lot of scrap out there, but let's just say that I'm China or I'm India. Actually, I'll use China because this is what happened. Uh, China has been importing silver hand over fist. Now, it's a precious metal, but they're also using it primarily industrially for solar panels. We can get into that uh, later on. But they're buying as much as they can. And they may not be buying directly from the COMEX, but whoever they're buying it from is getting it directly from the COMEX. And so the COMEX continually gets depleted. And that silver ends up making its way to China. Now, to your point about trust, the silver in the COMEX vault is also not getting a lot of silver brought into it anymore. Because the Mexican miner isn't going to trust the U.S. The whole supply chain is messed up. He's not going to leave it there. He's not as trusting. And then here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Kicker is China says, well, we need silver. Where are we going to get it? China is now buying directly. Now, this is a fact. China is now mm -hmm. buying directly from Mexican silver miners. So mm -hmm. the Mexican silver miners have less to put in that financial system. They have less right. to put in the COMEX vault. And not only that, China's not just buying uh, directly from them. China's buying from them unrefined. So they're buying ore and they're refining it themselves. It's like, we're, I mean, I'm not saying that we're running out of silver. Everyone is saying that. And, and there's there's some truth to that. But uh, I just want to say that, that the ease with which we could get high grade silver has decreased. And mm -hmm. so people who want it are responding and people who have it aren't making it available uh, to the financial world. So yeah, you're right. I mean, the orange by, juice thing is the silver yeah, thing. By bypassing the uh, the COMEX and the LBMA and going directly to the source to get the the silver. Or I remember it's been a few months, but and uh, I think it was uh, SD Bullion puts out a weekly little video, but he had some clips from Chinese state television where they were talking to uh, silver refiners in China and these guys were like up in arms saying like, you know, we need more silver. We need more silver. And they even pointed out they were joking. They were like, it doesn't make sense that the silver price is affected by what what Jerome Powell says in the United States. And it's great. Like they were like almost frustrated, but also poking fun at the uh, I guess you would call it the electronic market. And it goes with what you said. Right. Like people like, well, why do I if I'm a Chinese silver refiner uh do i want to try to get silver on a futures contract why why wouldn't i just get it directly from the source exactly it might be exactly. might be more more cost effective as well right well i mean let, let's assume that it's not more cost effective i mean no i'm saying it may be but let's assume let's right. take that out of the equation and just look at it this way look at it this way i'm in china and i'm willing to go through the hassle of calling this guy in Mexico, of arranging a deal, of sending a ship, of not using dollars, when I could just press a button. Well, why am I doing that? It comes down to the original thing you said. There's a lack of trust. And that lack of trust globally creates risk that makes you comfortable going the extra yard to get what you have to get. And then if it's cheaper, well, that's another, that just makes it that much easier. Yeah. You, you mentioned SD Bullion. I want. I want to. I want to uh, say something about them. Um, I, I know James by reputation, mm -hmm. and we 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 connect in social media. And um, and by no means, I'm not. I'm not a representative for them. I just want to say that 
uh, uh, James and SD Bullion, uh, they put out some good some good quality content. And and the reason I bring that up is because their their commentary about silver is, and I'm not saying, well, I have a contact in mainland China who's deep, like up to his neck in silver and gold. And uh, I've written several articles about that. Well, actually, he wrote them and I translated them from Chinese. And mm -hmm. what SD Bullion said is absolutely true. Absolutely yeah. true. And the reason China is not crying to have the price of silver higher is because they're still buying it. You know, they're like, <laughs> you want to keep it low, we'll just keep buying it. So, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. It's a joke. Yeah, like, like there's a problem, but, you know, we're going to keep grabbing it. And I've heard some people even even throughout the prospect of, you know, if if Samsung or Apple or Tesla or any of these other big companies, big market cap, massive market cap companies that use a lot of silver, that that it, that if one of them gets scared about their, you know, ability to get silver. And again, it's, you know, who knows? And it, 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 it's it's not worth necessarily uh, uh hypothesizing when it would happen but that it could happen at some point that you know that there could be a almost like a rush like when the dam breaks like well i need to get my silver i need to supply i need to i need to secure my supply of silver speaking of sd bullion james is also a guest on chris marcus's arcadia economics and you know chris marcus and i have been working together for over a year and a half and he introduced uh you and i i have a, a program that chris has me on for every monday morning called the silver fix and uh uh well, anyway, I just want to say hello to Chris and uh, thank you for the introduction. Well, and I'll I'll say the same. Uh, I hold Chris Marcus and Arcadia Economics in high regard, uh, and it's really where I was introduced to you. And you know, as we talked about earlier, Vince, uh, you know, we all want to learn new things in this industry, and uh, you through Arcadia Economics have given me multiple opportunities. Um, where new ideas, new concepts come come alive, and uh, and I appreciate that. And of course, I think everybody in the community appreciates what Chris Marcus and Arcadia have done for the uh, for the whole silver field. You got it. And I want to and I want to circle back quickly to what you said about the Chinese getting it directly from Mexico. I mean, if I put myself in the shoes of a Chinese silver refiner, um, and I'm a I like to call myself resourceful, frugal guy. And um, and very cautious in a lot of ways. I love silver and gold. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I'm that Chinese silver refiner, I feel better knowing that, yes, I get my shipment of ore directly from Mexico. I pay for it. It's mine. It's done. As opposed to, well, I can buy this futures contract and maybe in 14 days or maybe in six, however long it is, I might get my silver. Does that, does that make no. sense? Yeah. In fact, in fact, I think one of the reasons globalization works so well is, 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 is gone. And that's why globalization is not working now. And that reason was like to, to, to look at your comment from, from that point of view, it may be more difficult. It may even be more expensive and it may take longer to get my silver, but there's only one connection. It's me to that guy yeah. and back. Yeah. When yeah. you deal with a global supply chain, when it's humming, it's great. But when it's not, what is it? It's a bunch yeah. of intersections. The yeah. guy who pulls it out of the ground, the guy who gives it to that guy. And before you know it, it's it's the whole concept of, you know, I'm eating I'm eating a, a, a fruit cup, you know, from pears in Argentina uh, that are packaged in China that are marketed through, you know, Canada. And, yeah. and you're like, well, you know, why don't I just have the whole thing done in one place. And and yeah. that's what's going on. When the global supply chains don't work, it's easier to have less intersections. You know, yeah. less it's off. much it's much cleaner um from the Chinese refiner perspective just to get it directly to get the ore directly from from a miner in Mexico. And and to use your pair <laughs> excuse me, your pair example, right? Yeah, the the pears are grown in Argentina, packaged in China you know, come through wherever port and get shipped all over the, you know, as opposed to maybe it'd be better for events just to, you know, drive five miles up the street to the local farm stand and buy a couple yeah. pairs. Right. That's, that's <laughs> totally it. It's a, it. Like that's, it's the, it's the cleaner's the word you used. And that's a great word. Yeah. It's, it's a heck of a lot. It's like, I need the pairs. 
I don't need yeah. the promise of the pears. I need the pears, you know? Right. I need yeah. the gold. I need the silver. I need the pears. I don't I don't need them next week. I need them, you know, give yeah. them to me. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You you uh you you to shift gears for a second, you touched on uh the silver shortage, right? Mm-hmm. I talk about it. Everybody t- makes good content on YouTube. And I hear different perspectives. Uh, I think I, I listened to this guy, Jeff Christian, the other day, talk about, well, you know, you can't really factor in investor demand. And there's just all kinds of numbers out there. And I guess we could talk for hours on the subject. But um, do you feel like, I guess, from a big picture perspective, that uh, at least from a supply di- a supply demand dynamic that 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 the that the general conditions will remain favorable for silver if we look out I don't know five ten years yeah you know uh, first of all I know Jeff Christian I've known him I've known his work since 1993 so I'm quite familiar with with um with his perspective uh, I'm going to this sounds this almost sounds arrogant but I'm going to lay this out. For your audience mm-hmm. as best I can and as clearly as I can without any uh, gray areas that are uh, me making stuff up. First of all, very I'm going to try and keep this brief, but I started trading silver in 1993. I studied the market for years uh, as well. I started as a der- I'm a derivatives options market maker, so I am as financial as they get. But I taught myself the fundamentals because as time went on, I wanted to know the market. I talked to the biggest traders in silver for years, players. I had their ear. They were mentors to me. I was a protege to them. All right, so that's my pedigree, right? So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna just lay it out there. The silver market is has evolved since, you know, since post-film, since the 90s, mm-hmm. since the advent of technological innovations. The silver market has re-evolved into being a very largely used industrial metal. To say that you can't measure investor demand is wrong, Jeffrey, wrong. Uh, To say that you can't count on investor demand is true, but you can't count on anything. And you Mm -hmm. can measure investor demand and you can look at it. Now, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say is that the available amount of silver above ground for investment purposes is decreasing because the industrial demand is ramping up exponentially, or I don't know if it's exponential, I'm throwing a word out there. So the bull scenario is, and I'll give you the bear scenarios or the or the mitigating scenario as well. The bull scenario is forgetting the investor demand. That's not gonna go away. And we can talk about that uh, in a mm-hmm. second. Forgetting the investor demand, all advances are going to make silver more practical to use in smaller quantities. So, uh, for example, silver is more expensive than copper, but you can now use, I'm not saying you're going to, it's still too expensive. You can now get an extremely, extremely thin coating of silver in your windshield to act as uh, uh, a defroster. Okay. Mm -hmm. It conducts electricity. It also keeps the sun out. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out and buy that car, but I'm saying they're looking for ways to use smaller amounts of silver. And so the bear, your bearish viewer, if you have one, uh, is going to is going to say, well, they're using less silver. They can use less silver. I'm like, yeah, but they can use it in more things, you know? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so for example, uh, I can buy a silver solar panel and it uses, uh, let's say an ounce of silver, I'm just making numbers up, and it costs a hundred thousand dollars. Well, when they figure out how to use one tenth of an ounce of silver, the price is going to go down to $150 for the whole panel and, and the whole world will want them. The whole yeah. world will be able to afford them. So it's actually like the democratization of industrial silver. So as technology improves using less and less silver, yeah. you're going to be using it for broader and broader applications. That's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, um, <clears throat> what is bearish or what mitigates that are two things. One is, are we going to stop with all this ESG stuff? And I don't think we're going to, st- I think we're going to stop with ESG, uh, but we're not going to stop with the pursuit of net zero. And that means renewable energy where we can, solar energy, forgetting about wind, all this stuff, but solar panels are here to stay. And, and it's being horribly implemented uh, at, at the governmental level, but the technology is going to get better and governments will catch up. So why I bring that up is because if there's a hiccup at the government level, 
<laughs> or excuse me, or some, oh no, we're not doing this right. We can't use them anymore. As we go back to fossil fuels, mm -hmm. you could see a big hiccup in demand and silver could drop. That's when you should be buying it. The second reason uh, that silver uh, could drop is, is lesser understood. Jeffrey Christian understands this. Uh, is lesser understood, uh, but there isn't, okay, compared to gold, there's a massive above ground supply of silver and scrap that's not readily available. Now, it comes in all different forms, you know, from your, the, the recycled phone, what have you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to, to give you one example of it, silver is a, believe it or not, a waste product of certain base metals. So zinc, uh, for example, uh, I think nickel was, I'm not sure, but there's another one. And wh what happens is they pull their zinc out of whatever, you know, earth that they're pulling up and they have this big pile and they leave these, I mean, they, I mean, it's true. They leave these yeah. piles and when they get enough, they throw acid on it, they heap leach the silver out and they sell the silver. It's extra money for them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that scrap silver in all its forms you know from from your from your grandmother's silverware to uh the pile of iPhones that someone is hoarding and I don't mean like five iPhones I mean you know 500,000 like there are people yeah. there are scrap dealers in silver this is not you know like a small business when silver hits a price you want to see $30 $50 you will see big knee jerk reactions lower because when it hits a price then it's economically feasible for someone to pull the silver out of the scrap. And then you'll see that supply hit the market in a wave mm -hmm. and drop the market down. So those are mm -hmm. things to, 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 to note. And the reason that I, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on that right now, because that's what's going on right now. That's one of the reasons silver is depressed. I mean, there's other reasons, but that's one of the reasons silver is, despite the COMEX vault being empty, the price is pretty stable. Well, that's because JP Morgan and the other big banks their business is to find silver for their clients. Who's their client? China. Who's their client? The United States. Their client's not the COMEX. They don't want to mm -hmm. use an exchange. They do because they have to. They want to be direct intermediaries. So who are their clients? Well, some of their clients are buyers and some of their clients are miners. Mm -hmm. You mine zinc. You have any silver left over over there? We'll take it. And that's what's happening. You're seeing scrap being pulled off the market. And at certain okay. prices, you're going to see it hit the market hard. So the two mitigating uh, circumstances are uh, if there's a hiccup in the uh, implementation of solar, uh, could be geopolitical, just could be uh, could be cost. Uh, and if there's a, a big scrap pile coming onto the market, you're going to see silver take a hit. Uh, but these will be, and I say this very confidently from my own portfolio, these will be opportunities to buy and, 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 I, and I will buy. So that's that's what's going on. Uh, and I'm not even getting into the uh, into the uh, investment aspect. We can get into that in context of gold. But yeah, yeah. that's that's a big deal. Silver's, yeah. too, silver's a critical metal, Ron. Mm -hmm. They're not going to talk about it. They're not going to say, like, for example, you said Tesla and Apple, if they want all their silver. I'm sure they want their silver. And I'm sure the government's saying to them, we make nuclear bombs with silver. Do not mm -hmm. start cornering the silver market on us. We'll let you know if you have a problem. That's what I think. We'd like to thank our sponsor, First Mining Gold. They're a Canadian gold developer with two world-class projects in Canada. They also have a handful of other projects. When you total up all the gold in their resources, it comes to over 12 million ounces. They're worth checking out. I'll put a link to the company's website in the description below. Yeah, it's common sense. If they're worried about the supply of silver, the last thing they're going to do is telegraph to the market that they're worried about the, if they are indeed worried about the, the, the you know, the, the yeah. supply of silver. Yeah. It's, it's the example I use about we won't even get into the banks, but I tell people, you know, you're not going to walk into your local bank branch. You're going to see a placard that is advertising to you their 2% uh, platinum checking uh, account. They're not going to have a placard up that says, hey, our our uh, our portfolio of U.S. Treasuries has dropped by thirty percent, so you need to be right. worried about your your money, right? Right, so, right, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. I think the other thing with silver, uh, to to go back to what you said earlier, right? There's those supply issues, um, but then I really liked what you talked about with 
you know, yes, as they discover new ways to use less and less silver in different products, that makes it, um, how do I say this? That's offset by the increase in demand because that makes those products more viable, more affordable. Yeah, and yeah. and then, oh. go ahead. No, pro but for, from from the business owner's point of view, the profit margins go up. You know, a solar panel yeah. costs $100 to make and $90 of that is silver. Well, you're not going to make much money if the price of silver goes up. However, yeah. if you can reduce the amount of silver in it, you can drop the price to $20 and you can sell it to a lot more people. Like yeah, cars. yeah, yeah. Very interesting. I, and I and I have another question for you when it comes to this. Um, uh, and I like listening to Jeff Christian as well. I mean, I always like to look at all the different perspectives. Um, oh, yeah. But then I wonder about gold because if I mean, gold has has it can be used industrially, but but almost all the demand for gold, am I correct in saying, is investor demand? So you could say, well, there's really no demand for gold, right? Because any of the gold that people hold is available to be sold, right? Um, right, right. Um, yeah. Just to, to circle back to Jeff, I mean, look, Jeff Christian was, uh, he worked at Goldman Sachs. He understands the silver market probably better than anyone. I mean, I'll stand mm -hmm. next to him toe to toe, but <clears throat> Jeffrey, uh, knows all sides of the market inside and out industrial yeah. investment so he has to be he has a lot of big clients and he has to be uh careful i'm not here uh selling anything mm -hmm. except for my arrogance um but so so there you have <laughs> me. look he, he understands what buffett did when buffett bought in 97 he understands yeah. what happened in 94 he understands all those things i was trading against uh those traders uh doing that so i'm familiar with it mm -hmm. as well um but uh, with regards to gold, well, gold's kind of funny. You know, the the, the perception of the public, the, the, the mainstream perception of the public is this, right? To, to paraphrase what you're saying, all the gold that's ever been made is above ground. It's useless. And therefore, you know, we can't, you know, do anything with it. So what's it good for? And And there's a lot of merit to that. Gold is too expensive to be used practically industrially right now. now it may change someday. Um, but until that does, until they can find something that makes gold so uh, able to be used in such small quantities with such big, uh, big effect, uh, then the, the, the price of gold is going to be determined entirely by investment demand. That's the first thing. So go say. Gold is useless except as money. And that, ironically, is why it's perfect as money. Mm. You can't, I mean, yeah. you can make silver money. But if you were to make silver money, you run the problem of destroying industry. Yeah. Right? You run the problem yeah. of squeezing your money if industry needs more silver. You can't have dual use uh, assets as pure money. Gold is useless, which makes yeah. it perfect because it's too expensive. Be, which makes it perfect as money. What are you going to do with it? Well, you know, not to get theological with you, but everything on this planet, man has improved. Humanity has improved, except silver and gold. What can yeah. we do to gold to make it better? You can't. You can't. We can't make it. You can make oil into gasoline. You can make wheat into wheat thins. You, what can you do with gold? Jewelry? Okay, it's still gold. You haven't changed it fundamentally. You haven't added value to it. And because of that, it sits there. We don't know what to do with it. We admire it. Uh, but it also it becomes a good store of value. Now, to the, to the point about uh, all the gold being, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's all there. And, and Conversely, say with silver, because all the gold above ground is pretty much available, and there's not really a lot of significant gold in industrial applications, and because it's stored, and because it's there, it's usable as money. You can base an entire financial system out of gold because I can borrow gold from you and use that as money. It becomes, you can financialize gold very easily. And that's what they used against it for years, but now it's kind of butting them in the rear end uh, because other countries want the gold because they want to store their value. And, you know, we can talk about this till we're blue in the face, but why do you think central banks are buying it again? They're not buying it because it's shiny. They're buying it because if you're an Eastern central bank, 
and you're in Iran and you want to buy, I always use this analogy, but it's a good one. Pistachio, uh, Turkey makes a lot of pistachios. It's a big export for them. I'm yeah. Iran, I want to buy pistachios. Turkey's like, pay us in gold. Why? Because it's gold. You can't, you can't <laughs> mess with it. Okay, we'll pay, we'll work out the currency, but that's what's going on, right? Why is the West buying gold? Well, because we know that the world is de-dollarizing. We know that the world is becoming multipolar. And if it's multipolar in currency, it still needs something to back those currencies, whether it's explicitly or implicitly. And if I, in France, want to buy pistachios from Turkey, I'm not saying I do, but if I did, they may say they want gold. Maybe they mm -hmm. won't take dollars. Who knows? Russia is certainly not going to take dollars. And right. so you need to have some on your balance sheet as a bank, as a country, to trade internationally. Central banks are buying gold because they need gold. It's not a pretty object to them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. Vince, this has been great. Um, I think on behalf of all of our viewers, uh, thank you. And um, I have a feeling that our viewers might want to hear more from you in the future. Uh, but if they want to read your writings, you have a, a, a Substack newsletter, the Gold Fix newsletter. You want to tell the viewers about that? Yeah, um, there is. Uh, I pub During COVID, I started publishing uh, for fun uh, something called the Gold Fix. And, and it's basically it's a newsletter that covers uh, geopolitical and macroeconomic events with a focus on gold and silver. And that means money, inflation, war, things like that. There's a big tent. Some of it's tactical. Some of it's very wonky. Some of it's very much like this conversation we're having. And um, uh, there's a free subscription and there's a premium subscription. Uh, the, it's become it's become actually pretty popular and and uh, and I'm proud of it. You're going, if, if you were to subscribe, and I'm not pitching, I'm just going to explain it so you don't have to waste your time if you don't want to. Um, if you were to if you were to read it, you would get a mix of a healthy mix of actual bank research uh, broken down and analyzed, actual commentary on what that bank research is saying, uh, tactically what's going on. Like we covered in the last thirty days, covering the those two weeks that you're describing, mm -hmm. we wrote twenty one stories. No one covers it like we do. No one. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, there's only one other place that could cover it like we do, but they have. They have a lot more things to cover. And that would be like Zero Hedge, for example. Anyway, um, so I think I think the thing to do is, uh, why don't I just make you a 30% uh, uh, off for life link you can give to your subscribers and, and they can decide. So um, I'll do that. I'll send, I'll give you the link for that and, and they can decide. But, you know, there's a free version right. and you'll feel kind of spammed by that, but it's not a, it's a sub stack. So it's not a piece of garbage. And uh, you will... I, I think I think some of them will enjoy it. If they like this, they'll probably enjoy that. Yeah. Um, and 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 you have provided our viewers uh, with a great amount of insight. Um, it's really been awesome, Vince. Now I'm gonna ask you because I, I think you've been very humble. Um, if if uh if your mom was hanging out right now with one yeah. of her friends and bragging about Vince, what would she say? I know you're an adjunct professor. Uh, you're a former trader, and there's more. So what what would your mom be telling her friends as, as she was bragging about Benz? So people know who they're listening to here. Oh, uh, well, that's that's actually, that's really a, a <laughs> good way. No, that's really cool. That's a really nice tact. Um, um, what would she say? This is the cocktail party mom we're talking about. Oh, here. right. Yeah, okay, cocktail right. party the mom. Cocktail right. party mom. She's, she's bragging. She's bragging yeah, about yeah, yeah. it. My son... Uh, uh, he was the uh, the largest precious metals independent options trader on the floor uh, between 1995 and 1999. He ran his own company, employing 30 people. Uh, he uh, he managed money for billion dollar funds, and she would say this: he broke a bank, which in natural gas. And then she would say, <laughs> and and he teaches at UConn. So that's what she would say. <laughs> newsletter. I don't know what a newsletter is, you know. Yeah, that's what she would say. She would say. But well, he never writes. Yeah. He never writes or something like that, she would say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he never writes, right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure she uh, thinks very highly of you. And, uh, and, and now you're in Ron's basement, and it's been a real pleasure, Vince. I hope 
that we can uh, maybe sometime in 2024 have the privilege of getting to catch up with you again. I'll thank you on behalf of all of our viewers and remind them that if they want to learn more about you, I'll put the link to the Substack that you referred um, and in anything else that you send me uh, at the very top of the description of this thank video. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to come back. And uh, yeah, if, if I see something in the markets, I'll give it to you because I'm sure yeah. your, your viewers will be interested in it, especially on silver. Oh, you, you're, you're always welcome in the basement, Vince, uh, even before we, we take the uh, $2,500 gold blindfold off the bear behind That's me. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Vince. Thank you.